The first piece is there's a whole contemplative technology. Had we had that contemplative technology on the table for the last 2,000 years, can you imagine where we would be for where we are right now in history? It's particularly rich because it reveals the history and the wisdom and a stream that has been covered over and the interference of empire and of forces that hijacked our wisdom tradition. So I see a lot of the problems that we're facing now, the lack of the understanding of human interiors, the runaway technology, all of these kind of the, the fragmentation yeah. of our civilization. I think a lot of that is uh, related to this particular trauma that happened around 2000 years ago. Yeah. And that it, and that and that we're not going to really orient ourselves accurately towards the future if we really don't understand what our history really is. Welcome back to the transmission my friends. I often play with the idea if I could go back in time, if I could experience the truth about one bygone mystery lost to the sands of time, what would I choose? Perhaps high Egypt in its magical heyday. Uh, learn from Plato himself, or maybe one of the Neoplatonic or Hermetic sages like Iamblichus or Plotinus. Maybe go sit with Buddha under the Bodhi tree. The Eleusinian mysteries. Uh, then I start thinking about dumb tangential shit. Like, I don't even know any of those languages. I probably wouldn't even know what to do with myself in that historical milieu. But anyway, what really interests me is not that cultural aspect. It's not even the people who held the wisdom, though it would be cool to see what they were like in person. It's that elusive direct knowing, finding some level of previously unknown wisdom, truth about reality, you know, that gnosis, that anamnesis, that noesis, that initiation, that revelation. That is the stuff that really dips my wonder nuggets. Speaking of which, John Churchill is also really moved by that very motivation. He's dedicated his life to wisdom seeking in a multitude of ways. He's a doctor of psychology, longtime student and teacher of Tibetan Buddhism, integral theory, Chinese medicine, and more, all of which culminates in what he calls planetary dharma. I really felt like I was just scratching the surface with John in this conversation. It was just like a torrent of ideas and information, and there are just a multitude of other things I would have loved to riff with him about. Uh, but for now, for more color on what he's up to, go to planetarydharma.com. And you can also learn more about a training that begins in January there. Those links for John will be in the description. Uh, all the links for third eye drops will be as well. And on the note of this media vessel, we have hit a milestone, my friends. I suppose I should acknowledge it. 100,000 subscribers. Uh, on one hand, it's kind of surreal. On another hand, I still just feel like an absolute guppy in this whole ecosystem on another uh i guess i have three hands in this incarnation i clearly remember what it was like to just hope for a thousand subscribers or a thousand views on a video um and most importantly so much love so much gratitude to all of you for supporting for getting us here and on the note of subscribing uh do it if you haven't we must continue stimulating the algorithm with subs, likes, comments, shares. It never ends. The Daimon is ever hungry. Do subscribe to Third Eye Drops wherever you listen to podcasts. We've got hundreds of mind melds that you can only hear on audio platforms. If you want to not only support, but riff with me and hundreds of other fine, sweet beings, join up over at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops we've got a patron only discord server we do zoom hangs a book club you can get rewards like stickers pins shirts and more all at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops and with that let's meld minds with the wise and wonderful john churchill very excited for this mind meld man um you have a really eclectic background you're creating a harmony of a lot of different schools of thought that I haven't seen too many people really try to square the circle on in like a practical way, like a way that yes. revolves around praxis and, and not just ideas or, or philosophy. So what you're doing is really interesting and, and unique, and I've got a, a lot of questions about it. Great. Thank um, you. 
Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So the audience, I'll do, I'll do an intro. So they'll have some sense of where you're coming from and we don't have to go through like the boilerplate of your bio and everything. But okay. for my own sense, how did you reach this place where you're, you're trying to kind of fuse together all of these different worlds of, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, psychology, uh, integral theory, um, and, and where do you see, w what is the sort of true north, I guess, of of trying to combine all of these things? Like, where do you see this emerging thing heading? Well, I think the first thing to say is that in my direct experience, they are already synthesized in whole. Hmm. And that the the lineage that I find myself seated in, for want of a better word, is a, is a cosmopolitan lineage and historically kind of originates in Alexandria. Yeah. About 250 BC. Yes. And... So within that, within the mind, within my mind, but within that mind, because in that, in some senses, one has to learn to look at one's own processes objectively, and you, be that way, you could begin to get a sense of where one's mind stream is coming from, mm -hmm. so to speak. That there were that there were certain dimensions of our experience that are deeply personal, and then there are other di dimensions that are more abstract. And as you begin to get a sense of them, they have a they have a teleos. They kind of come from somewhere. Uh, if we were talking in Buddhist language, we might say that they are that they kind of the part of a reincarnating stream. Mm -hmm. And so that at that moment in time, there was a a very active Gnostic movement that was really. You know, there were there were Vedic scholars, there were Buddhist scholars, there were Greek masters and Egyptians and Hebrew and even Druids in the area of Alex of Alexandria as part of the the library and part of the uh, the research department. And we don't quite realize the degree of of exchange between the the that culture and then back into India. Right. So, you know, Alexander the Great left Gandavan cities, like Hellenic cities, all the way through Afghanistan. And many of the greatest Buddhist adepts were known to have um, been educated within that milieu. Yeah. And so what I'm... Yeah, it's it's less of an artificial trying to stick things together and more of a process of kind of revealing what was already whole, but because of the nature of the history in the West and the interference of empire and of forces that hijacked our wisdom tradition, yeah, that now these things seem very separate. But yeah. at one time, yeah. at one time, I believe that they weren't. Yeah, Alexandria around that age that you just brought up is one of the most interesting times in history, I think, because to your point, there's this huge cultural melting pot there and you're getting the collision of, you know, broadly Hellenes, right? Like people like like there's this phrase. Um, I don't remember where yeah. I first heard it from some platonic scholar or something that Hellenes aren't born, they're made. So there was already this idea that it didn't matter where you came from. Like you could be, as long as you were initiated into that, that language, that philosophy, that culture, you could become a Hellene. And it didn't, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, Scythian or Indian or what, whatever you can, you can be a Hellene and in this tradition, in that milieu that you brought up. But then, but then there's also this like, this competition emerging, right? Like you have growing Christianity and you have like Christian mobs clashing with Hellenic mobs. And there's like these famous 
um, episodes in history that you were bringing up, like Library of Alexandria, sacking of the Serapium, murder of Hypatia. So it's like these ideas all coexisted, but it was also kind of fraught at the same time. And but I, I do think you're right. I mean, clearly there were pockets of like all these different thinkers coming together um, and sort of really the like some kind of multicultural, not just esoteric wisdom, but like mainstream educational cooperation between different philosophies and ethnic groups and um, schools of thought. So, so yeah, I mean, and I want to learn more about this this place in this this age as well because it just seems very very rich well i think it, i think it's for the western psyche for where we are right now in history it's particularly rich because it reveals it reveals a history and a wisdom and a stream that has been covered over more so by by christianity yeah and when you've experienced a trauma, like a personal trauma, it's very difficult to move into the future if you're not aware that you've been traumatized. So if you're not aware that, that, that something was stolen from you, then of course, what you think of as the past is actually a defense mechanism. It's a construction. And then you project from that past into the future. So I see a lot of the problems that we're facing now in terms of, let's say, you know, ethical issues, the lack of the, the understanding of human interiors, the runner, the runaway technology, all of these kind of the, the fragmentation yeah. of our civilization. I think a lot of that is uh, related to this particular trauma that happened around 2000 years ago. Yeah, and that it, and that and that we're not going to really orient ourselves accurately towards the future if we really don't understand what our history really is. Um, you know, and, and I think the last piece I would add to it to add to that is is my you know my intuitions, and this is only through what we would call in Buddhism direct, non conceptual, valid knowing. So that's not mm -hmm. you know I, I, can, I can only just say it through through kind of that kind of direct insight that Christianity and what we know is the Mahayana, so the, the, the universal vehicle of Buddhism, grew out of the same petri dish and that essentially the project was going so well it got hijacked hmm. and that Rome got itself involved in something that was really a, an attempt at a universal solar mystery school like you know where yeah we you know if we if if we want to come together in alexandria and I, we want to talk to the vedic scholars and the buddhists and the greeks and the druids we're going to have to have an agreement and that agreement is a solar agreement because we can all agree upon the nature of the sun so to speak yeah and so so that my sense is is that project was going quite nicely and then rome realized that it was that there was a good thing going there and essentially kind of shifted his whole cult of the emperor into that and we lost you know we, we lost um we lost something significant so so that, absolutely I mean, and that's of course that's only my intuitive you know that that's only coming from kind of intuition right right yeah, the early day, like uh, my, you know, my my knowledge of history is spotty and biased toward the figures that I'm really interested in. But to to sort of flesh out this time in history, you you have like pretty much complete hegemony of the Roman Empire, but it's slow. Like the sands of influence are slowly shifting toward an emerging. Like in this age, we're talking about Christianity is still sort of like forming and it, it exists, but it's like not there's no big established church yet. But then in the following couple of centuries, you really get this cultural hegemony um, that's sanctioned by Roman emperors. And it becomes not just taboo to be, quote unquote, pagan, but you can be prosecuted. You can be 
thrown in prison. You can be um, put to death for doing mystical practices that were seen to be outside the boundaries of being Christian. So then there, so then all of this stuff gets pushed underground, any kind of esoteric practice, any kind of, um, to your point, the, the, you know, the longstanding mystery traditions like Eleusis, they become increasingly marginalized and then eventually completely shut down. Um, you know, so it's, it's like it either had to have been absorbed into this, institutionalized sanctioned kind of Christianity that eventually becomes the Catholic church, or it has to get destroyed or pushed underground. And I think that speaks to some of the things that you've lost, but I'm curious, like specifically, are there, are there elements of that, that you particularly uh, yearn for or are fascinated with? Well, I mean, the first piece is there's a whole contemplative technology yeah. Right. So um, that, you know, the, the, that's been held. I mean, really, the Tibetans, the Tibetans received the entire corpus of what was happening in India before the the Mongols, the kind of Islamic invaders, wiped Buddhism out of India. So, mm-hmm. you know, what we see in um, in Tibet is essentially Indian Buddhism. And... Um, you know, I have a pretty, I have a pretty good sense that, you know, that of course that was refined for a long time, but the truth is, is had we had that contemplative technology on the table for the last two thousand years, can you imagine where we would be? No, it would be the same. <laughs> it's the same thing as saying is like, well, listen, that you know, that the clearly the Christians went after the the. Uh, ethnogens of yeah. the ancient world. Um, can you imagine if we had had 2,000 years of engaged alchemical study in psychedelics, where we would be now with the kind of sophistication that we would be, you know... <laughs> so so I think where I'm, you know, what, what strikes me is, is that this is kind of true in some ways of every department of the academy. Yeah, because when you lose sacred world, you know what kind of happened. That the the the, uh, the the Roman Empire's Sith movement is to kind of separate matter and spirit. So there's no longer a spectrum between the two, because it used to be in the mysteries, and, and of course you still this, see this in in India and in Tibet, but, you know, this kind of idea of a spectrum of consciousness or a spectrum of matter, and therefore it wasn't that it was just matter and spirit, but it was that there was a, you know, a gradation between the two. Now, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but actually it's a massive deal because the divide and conquer move is to say, this is matter, you get to have that and give that to science, so to speak, and this is spirit, and we get to have that. And there's no relationship between the two. And spirit is somehow right. related to um, you know, the the other world that has no relationship with matter, and matter has no relationship with spirit. Right. I think, you know, what we would have seen had that academy not been destroyed is essentially a dimension of the sacred that really, you know, expressed through math through geometry, through the understanding of harmonics and music, and through the understanding of cosmology. And that would have informed the last 2,000 years of our development. Yeah, man. Um, And so the reason why this is really important right now is, you know, we have this kind of fourth industrial revolution, like gaining speed. And... um, you know, we can talk about that as a symbol of a planetary process because really what we're seeing there is not separate from the newest sphere itself, i.e. the evolution of the planet. So we would have also had an understand, understanding at this point the kind of consciousness or human evolution is a dimension of the evolution of the planetary system of Gaia, Sophia, if you will. So we wouldn't mm-hmm. we wouldn't have a 
a spirituality or contemplative practices that were kind of divorced from understanding how that was part of the world system. Right. Um, yeah. So, so uh, you know, the 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 sense of the possibility of this actually this technology giving us the opportunity to reboot um, these traditions in such a way that actually we can catch up fast. It's a Hail Mary's pass, if you will. <laughs> but but I, I do think that um that without this understanding of the the depth of interiors and and how that would add to every department of the academy, that's the that is needed to that fourth churning of the Dharma, as we would put it, in the Buddhist tradition is needed to meet this fourth industrial revolution. And if that doesn't happen, my concern is that we lose the human soul, that yeah. the, the, the interior gets swallowed by the wash of techni and psyche is, um, is lost for you know a long time. So yeah. I think that's, I don't know if that answers your question, yeah. but those, the, those are yeah. the things that really speak to me. Totally, man. Yeah, that I think that that is what's on the line. And to your point that, you know, in slowly there is this creep and you explained it, the the cash value of it really well. There's this creep of putting God, well, first of all, reducing divinity to this one specific God. And then that God is completely outside of space and time. And, and this isn't even really in the Bible. This is like <laughs> later, from my understanding, this is like later points of Catholic doctrine that just become accepted. And what does that imply? It implies that we're these sort of like orphaned children that are completely apart from divinity, except for, you know, we can we can pray in a sort of unidirectional way and we can follow the rules and then receive absolution when we die, if we're lucky. But other than that, there is no divinity. The world is not divine. God is not in the world. And you better just do your time here and like clench your butthole, right? It's like, that, that's sort of like, that's sort of like the, the picture that's painted. And on the other hand, the reason I'm so in love with platonic mysticism and hermeticism and Western esotericism in general is because it's the exact opposite picture. It's like you live in a world of spiritual forces that are emanating from some kind of transcendent unity. And then that thing's, you know, tendrils yes. harmonize and interconnect all throughout the cosmos and flow down here. And you are connected to that and you are participating in that. And you can feel that and you can go to, you know, whatever chosen language you want to put on that realm, you can go there, you can experience it, you can interface with other consciousnesses. Um, and that's just yeah. such a more, not only interesting world, but it's it's like a, it's hopeful, you know? Whereas this other way is, is just like a, it just evokes this kind of fear-based existence that is just like traumatizing. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. I mean, the, these, what you are, what we're talking about is, from a Buddhist perspective, the effect of multi generational trauma and how multi generational trauma warps the mind and perception. Um, I mean, this is one of the things why, um, I, I, maybe I'd say I'm a Hellenic Buddhist in the sense that the like that the that the Buddhist psychotech is probably the the best in the sense of like honestly being worked on and updated the most and when you can kind of remove or drain out the kind of maybe the the cultural tibetan or, or indian tendencies for ascendancy mm -hmm. so to speak that are maybe part of their culture and reconnect those that that mahayana buddhism back to its hellenic roots then like the hermetic thought, like the, the Western esoteric tradition, you actually get a Western esoteric Buddhism that I honestly believe was alive, alive in Alexandria that I think really has a lot to offer 
of the Western esoteric tradition and people who are really interested in making that journey as, yeah. as, yeah, as a real, as a real lived experience. Yeah. I'm, I'm so interested in this and, and I think you're right because we don't, not only is the Buddhist psychotech probably the best, we don't really know what the, from my understanding, what the Western psychotech is. And you see that it existed in people like Plotinus, for instance, he's probably the most famous you know, he's considered the father of Neoplatonism and what little instruction he provides sounds very much like Eastern, what we would now consider to be Eastern meditation. You know, he says, uh, withdraw from sensory input, go within, like, um, you know, and, and if you are able to, I th he, he talks about it like, um, stains. He says, if you're able to remove the stains of the outside world, you will begin to comprehend beauties that you, that there is nothing that rivals those beauties in the outside world. Those, those beauties of the intelligible realm and the, and the realm of noose, as they would call it, um, go far beyond everything. And also this is how you find out more about reality. Like the, the way you found out more about, and you see this all the way back in Plato himself as well, you know, that there's this like epistemic ladder that one goes up that goes to that kind of non-conceptual, non-dual knowing that you were Is talking it? about earlier. I was just, um, have you heard of the uh, idealist philosopher Federico Fagin? I haven't, no. though. He's a yeah. so he, absolutely brilliant man. He's the uh, inventor of the microprocessor. Um, but he's got this whole, you know, he's part of this kind of new wave of idealist philosophers, people like um, Do Dr. Donald Hoffman, um, Bernardo Kastrup. Um, and, and he is describing exactly what this this same state that i think both buddhists and platonists are talking about that he arrived at independently this sort of like um non-dual non-conceptual knowledge that is not the result of study it's just felt it's like you're you're in the you are it you are in the presence is of it, it. Is it? and is it? the idea that that's how you arrive at the highest knowledge is totally alien to most people in the West. It's like, no, you, you have to learn through reading books and through learning equations and through, um, you know, whatever kinds of didactic um, processes. Right. That's right. You know, what What might be interesting for us is maybe to, to kind of explore, obviously we can't do that experientially, but what might be that, what does that process look like? Mm-hmm. And then, and then let's get a cross tradition. Like maybe you can give me insights into how the Neoplatonists would have described that. Yeah. Um, because actually, the 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 non dual realization, so to speak, is actually just the big is is the end of the beginning. That's <laughs> interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so I think it'd be useful for us to to kind of mm -hmm. explore that, and maybe the listeners would find that interesting. I would love to. Right. Yeah. Okay, so obviously there's there's in all these traditions there's a there's all kinds of preliminaries, and essentially, basically, what the preliminaries are about is developing the motivation to go on the journey, right? And 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 that can often be reflections on on the the, the misery caused by being trapped inside of cyclic traumatic experience and the the goodness and truth and beauty of what's possible but the tendency is more towards pointing out like a doctor would point out this is the sickness right now let's address that and less so much about dangling the goodies in front of you because if you haven't tasted the goodies mm -hmm. then that doesn't make sense right um so that's kind of the Preliminaries. Then, of course, we go through a phase of having to calm the mind down and essentially calming the attentional system. Yeah. Right. So, the attentional system itself, I think this is important to understand, is understood to be the the Atman or the soul. So, the the attention, the the sense of that single point. The attention that is the center of the self, right? So we have the personality, we have Michael, we have John. 
And then there is a point inside of that that moves around at a high speed, that's the attentional system, and mm -hmm. glues together our feelings and thoughts and, and, and to, to give a sense of the hologram that is the personality, if you will. So the calming of the attentional system is related to not only just kind of calming the mind down and developing stability, but also bringing the soul and, and bringing the soul and helping it to reside in the heart as a new, as a new place of, of residing. And so that part of the training involves what we would call calm, staying, calming the mind down, learning to, sh to eventually kind of cause the, the, the mind mm -hmm. to quieten the withdrawal of the senses thought stops and the attention is just able to just simply stay with what with what is right there mm -hmm. and I mean and that kind of training is shared in all the mystical traditions right that is actually the common training right. it's like the preliminaries and then from there in the Buddhist tradition we then engage in the process of gaining insight and, if, and there's a number of different ways of doing this. There's the Theravada approach, which is quite different from the Mahayana approach. As I said, this Mahayana approach, I really believed, was influenced by the Greeks. So the, the main tool of insight in that tradition is what they call insight into the emptiness yeah. of phenomena. If we were to... If we were to report that another way, it's an insight into the deep interconnection of everything, that nothing mm. exists as a separate self-existent entity. Everything is interconnected. And that that kind of knowing, when you experience it, you experience it as a heart wisdom that's why it's cool, you know, that's why the essence of those teachings is in the Heart Sutra. So it's really that kind of wisdom is, is the essence of Sophia. It is the philosophia. It is the love of wisdom. Yes. It is love wisdom, so to yes. speak. But actually, when you penetrate and you see through the solidity of things, the experience is philosophia. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why in the Buddhist tradition, this kind of deeply philosophical practice was actually seen as a feminine wisdom. So much like Sophia, what they called um, Prajna Paramita was a feminine goddess because it was the kind of wisdom that it liberated, but rather than liberating beyond something, you were liberated into and through everything. Wow. Right? So... Yeah, I'm going to give you a little bit more, and I'd love to hear your reflections on this. Um, yeah, my really my mind in... my mind is swimming with connections, and I'll I'll do my okay. best to try to give you something coherent. Right. So okay, so the process of leaving the cave, so to speak, is oh yeah yeah. So we have a number of structures. We have a thought process. We have the self structure, the body structure, the the sense of dualistic perception as a structure, time as a structure, and then individual consciousness as a structure. So think of those like we have an, a, a warm ocean and you take a bathtub and you sink that bathtub into the ocean. You take a bucket and you sink the bucket into the bathtub and you take a cup and you sink the cup into the bucket, right? The little fish swimming inside that cup is like, oh yes, this is lovely warm water. But this warm water, yes, it is water, but it's not the same water as the water in the bucket or the water in the bathtub. It's not the open ocean. Yeah. So the process of, of inside of the Mahayana tradition is a process of kind of seeing through. So it is not a process of transcending. It's a process of seeing through. And in, in, in that way, what it was that appeared to obstruct it is no longer an obstruction. And that's really important because when it's done the wrong way, that's when you lead to a kind of a, an ascending type path, which is not yeah. really how the, the non-dual is meant to work. It's meant to be 
that actually you see through the the self and the body structure, but you still have a self and a body structure, and you see yeah. through dualistic perception, and you still have dualistic perception, but you're aware of the 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 wider field, so to speak, mm -hmm. and that's that's a really important. Um, that's a really important understanding because what that leaves then is an is a is an integrated human being with the highest and the lowest kind of together. And what that then reveals when you go through that process of kind of purification of perception, because that's really what's happening, mm -hmm. is then slowly stabilizing this um non-dual loving wisdom that is intimate with everything. And yes. of course, as that deepens, that then deepens into dreaming and deep sleep. So eventually that becomes a, a realization that extends through all states. And then the last thing I'll add is, is that between this non-dual field and the personality structure, what's actually more interesting than non-duality is, is the soul. And the soul is actually a structure. The reason why the Buddhists will say anatman or there is yeah, no yeah, soul yeah. is because, well, like every other structure, there is no body. There's no physical body if you look at it through the eye of wisdom. So, so with, through the eye of wisdom, you could say that there's no such thing as a soul, but from a pragmatic wisdom point, of course there is. And what the soul is, is a structure, a triadic structure of very high level pattern recognition on one hand, the the attentional system, like the ability of pure I am, mm -hmm. and then the um, then a field like wisdom. So non dual wisdom is is the complete wholeness of everything. And from that view, there is no distance, there is no field. Everything is a single whole. Yeah. But if you go down a few levels to the level of the soul, rather than having no time or no space, you have infinite time and infinite space. And that's the realm within which the soul operates. So the soul operates oh, yeah. within this field of, of information mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that is carried on universal love. Yes. That, so you have the attentional system, pattern recognition, universal love, and its way of knowing is direct. Yeah. Now, that field of you, that that place within you is in resonance with the anima mundi. So this is this is important. When you experience synchronicity, that is the communication system between the soul, your individual soul, and the 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 ma, the soul of the earth, in her attempt to facilitate the you know the, the ripening and the fruition of your path as a bodhisattva so the term bodhisattva in the buddhist tradition i would translate as soul mm -hmm. and, and this intermediary principle is actually in my mind more important than non-dual wisdom <laughs> because actually this intermediary principle first it has cognition yeah it has sophisticated pattern recognition and it is synchronized with the unfolding intelligence of the earth. So it actually knows exactly what's needed at this moment in time. Yeah. It's not, it's not just timeless time. It is sacred time as an expression of the seasons and the cycles of our planet. Yep. And so it's the birth of that intermediary principle, which the Christians called the Christ. The bodhisattvas, they call the bodhisattva, or we could call the soul, that is actually between emptiness and form, that is really where the magic happens, if that makes sense. Yes. It's, it isn't yes. just, so the non-dual realization is necessary for the birth of that new sense of individuality, which is, which is not just, it's, it's like unicity. Yeah, it's an individuality that is simultaneously woven into the whole. I, so, I, yeah. I, so, so tell me, like, I, I would love to hear because you are so well saturated in these 
Hellenic traditions. What it is? What do you hear when I share that with you? I mean, I, I can't, I can't recall every single thing that we just riffed on, but sure. throughout, throughout, <laughs> throughout, throughout the, throughout everything you were saying, I was just picking out of the air, like this reminds me exactly of this within Platonism. This reminds me exactly of that within Platonism. Like, so for instance, um, well, well, okay. I'll, I'll start with what, what would it look like to actually do the practices and have those realizations? Cause this is a short, a shorter answer because it's nice. by nature an incomplete answer. So one, there there are a pretty large contingent of scholars who do believe that there were esoteric sort of initi initiatory practices within Platonism. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Like he, he alludes to concepts that are clearly esoteric that you would only know if you had requisite wisdom, like Pythagorean concepts, geometrical concepts. But then it, they're, they're not just, you know, naked concepts that don't have a philosophical teaching on top of them. You know, there, there is a sacred element to them. So like if you read the Timaeus, for instance, which is the um, platonic dialogue that has to do, it's the only platonic dialogue that's basically a lecture by an initiated Pythagorean sage. And the initiated Pythagorean sage is telling you how God, like the Demiurge, in in not the evil Gnostic sense, but the 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 direct Greek way, like creator consciousness. This is how creator consciousness created the cosmos. And if you read that, it's very clear that there it's just filled with all kinds of esoteric stuff. And um, many of them have been decoded. Probably many of them still have not been decoded. So this did exist, but there's no agreement on whatever it was, whatever they were doing. What we know more of is what Neoplatonists were doing, like um, Plotinus and Iamblichus and Proclus. And they had a... Um, so though I was talking about noesis, this, this non-dual kind of knowing, you were not gifted to these kinds of experiences without being educated, like in, in the Hellenic sense. Like you needed to know like, you know, trivium, quadrivium type of... Um, academics you needed to be a virtuous person like you needed to embody the virtues and then these these were like almost more advanced studies that you were ready for after that kind of classical education like very famously above plato's um academy it said let none ignorant of geometry enter here so it's like it's it's this understanding that we're looking for a kind of wisdom that is transcendent yet is is not theoretical like we're going to find immortal this, forms of wisdom this, this through is. experience through mathematics through philosophy um but now getting to some of the specific examples of some of these concepts you were talking about where it's just you know um light bulb after light bulb of like yeah there's this exact same concept um first of all it's really interesting you said that there's this like triune sort of nature to the soul because that's a very famous platonic doctrine you know the tripartite soul um you know it's really it's a unity but when it's in your body it's eros thymos and logos and there's this whole platonic dialogue the phaedrus that kind of talks about how you need to organize your your um your eros thymos and logos and obviously um, they use this famous analogy of the chariot where it's like you have this this pilot and then you have two horses one horse always wants to pull you down to earth through passions and through temptation, uh, one horse, and, and that's the one that represents Eros. Then you have the um, horse that represents Thymos, which is the spirit, and that wants to like lead you upward. And then you have the um, the Logos, which is driving. You know, it's the one that's trying to keep the the um, the very passionate earthly horse in check. It's trying to to steer the spirited horse and balance the two. Um, so that that's a famous thing. But um, also, there's so much stuff in the symposium that alludes to what you were talking about in terms of this sort of the true nature of love as it relates to soul interconnectedness. And um, I can't summarize all of it, but there's a very famous exchange. It's not an exchange, but it's a part of Plato's 
or I'm sorry, Socrates's speech about the nature of of love, essentially. And he's talking about receiving a teaching from this basically enlightened priestess named Diotima. And she's telling him, it's one of the few times in the Platonic dialogues where Socrates is put at a lower rung than someone else. And Diotima is like this priestess who basically tells them, tells him, you're not ready for the highest initiation. But what I can tell you is this is essentially the real nature of love. And she calls it a daimon, not a god. And the reason is because it's this intermediary connecting principle that is the sort of fabric of reality. Go the, <laughs> the, 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 the punchline is sort of that you, as you become more wise, you stop looking for physical beauty and physical eros and you start appreciating the immortal concepts that are kind of emanating those qualities in a in a constant immortal way that will never die and you know there's like <laughs> oddly there's, enough there's, there's like there's like there's, um sort of one of the main sources of temptation that socrates resists is there's a you know how there was this convention in the Hellenic world where an older man would take a younger man and tutor them, but also have like a potentially a sure. sexual relationship with them. And there's this there's this guy who's you know supposed to be super attractive and just like the perfect person for Socrates to take in that way, and he's just not interested. You know, he's not interested in any kind in, in that thing anymore. He's interested in this like immortal kind of love that Diotima was telling him about, this immortal kind of beauty that permeates everything. Um so I could keep labbering on, but yeah, there's there's just so many. I mean, there's so many um harmonies and overlaps and uh, there, there's probably like but, 10 more, but I just I don't so want to keep good, going. Yeah, the good yeah. I mean the, so the good mu the good news is is that psychotechnology is operational it works it works repeatedly you know and having guided people for nearly two decades now and and, and some of that time was spent following students you know every month interviewing them for an hour so the part of my apprenticeship was then really like seeing how that then unfolds, so to speak, knowing of no, yeah. I was just going to say, what what do you which psychotechnology? Uh, what do you mean? Well, well, the one I was just describing for that that process of oh, okay. practice that that, that oh, process of okay. practice, you know, is can be, you know, you you can run through that, and can be, you know, within two or three years that part of the journey can can be um completed or well, enough enough that the soul then knows how to continue the work i mean a, a lot of actually i mean this is the thing about awakening the soul rather than just the non-dual realization because the non-dual realization you know those those techniques are something that you know m that you can be taught by somebody, but it's probably unlikely that you would come up with the techniques yourself. Mm -hmm. So the problem with that developmentally, we see this in the West is teaching teachers from the East coming, teaching somebody who's at a certain level of development practices that that person wouldn't have been able to design themselves. Yeah. They operationalize them and they have an awakening. However, that awakening is then reinterpreted at the level of development that they're at. And, and this is why the developmental process was so important. This was why it's the same thing in the Indian tradition. Uh, it was said, unless you master the five sciences, you won't be able to become fully realized. Unless right. you master the trividium and the quadrivium, your soul actually won't come alive because it's not just a kind of blank state that we're talking about. We're talking about awakening a dynamic intelligence. Mm -hmm. And when that dynamic intelligence is awoken, it's going to know like a salmon swimming upstream. Once it's given the knowledge basis, once it's given the technology, 
and and is taught it enough, it can then begin to actually work out how it's going to do that. And that's why the, the the awakening of the soul developmentally is so important and is more important in some ways than the non-dual realization, although ideally they happen as part of a, a single education. Yeah. Right? So I, so what I was saying, the good news is, is that those those technologies are you know are they they work <laughs> they work you know it's i think it's really exciting to ask ourselves okay, how do we translate them back into real western language so that they don't appear to sound like mm -hmm. they come from another culture because as you said it's a little bit suspicious. Well, you didn't say this, but I'm going to add this. It's a little bit suspicious that probably 99% of all the meditation research is on stuff from the East. That is beyond yeah. that, that level of, you know, that is beyond something that's suspicious there. So I, I think there is a, an unconscious resistance and maybe even conscious resistance. Mm hmm to how these practices would transform our civilization and and power and educate the people, educate people like yourselves and people who are listening in a psychotechnology that would fully empower them in such a way that they become the leaders. Because this kind of education was always meant, at least in the Buddhist tradition, it was meant to be a leadership education. You're not learning these things so that you can then feel good about yourself and just have, you know and have a spiritual trip. <laughs> You're learning the we're learning these these this education so that actually you can become a full member, a full citizen, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I, and I don't think you know. And of course, the way the power has been in our culture and civilization for the last few thousand years. We have, you know, there's been this emphasis on what well, we don't want wisdom power, philosopher kings. That's been, those, they've been kept at bay and actively suppressed. And then something else has been running the show. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not, and, and we're not headed in a great direction um, no. in, in that respect. But, but that, this is something I wanted to, a theme that I thought could run through this conversation. But before, before we go there, I just wanted to also bring up this other, um, overlap before I forget. Um, I was just doing a pretty deep dive into the teachings of the Neoplatonist Iamblichus because I talked to Gregory Shaw, who he's got a really interesting background, man, because he uh, he's a retired uh, philosophy professor now, but he, before um, you know going back to school to get a graduate degree, he was doing hardcore ascetic yoga practices, like abstaining from sex, really, um, you know, minimal clean diet doing yoga on a daily basis meditating all the time and he said he did you know it worked he got to essentially you know the state of like no vritti no no ripples like like sort of um i don't know uh, sam samadhi kind of consciousness yeah, on a sure. pretty regular basis but he found himself missing the mess a little bit and missing the earthly relationships a little bit and then he started learning about neoplatonism and how it seemed like there was this more kind of relational sort of um possibility that was both spiritual and, and western because he felt you know that practicing in this eastern way continually felt kind of foreign to him but but anyway one of the things iamblichus said um that's just a a glaring overlap um he essentially says the same thing using different language that there that the um there is essentially a a, a platonic bodhisattva and that there are um according to him three grades of souls in in terms of um reincarnation and incarnation in general and that you have sort of what he calls the herd of souls that are essentially not conscious they don't know why they're incarnating they're just going through these processes due to whims essentially like they they die and then they get attracted to a body for some reason that they're not at all aware of then there's like these uh second secondary you know mid-grade souls or whatever you want to call them that are working something out like they have they feel like 
they have some kind of lesson, some kind of healing, some kind of thing that they're working on. So either consciously or unconsciously, they incarnate in a life that will allow them to do that thing. Then the third grade of souls is essentially the bodhisattva, the one that, you know, he doesn't use that language, of course, but souls that purposely incarnate, purposely come to to teach, to help others, to guide. And that, that's just so interesting because that has so many um, downstream implications for the similarities of what the fuck it is that we're all trying to do here. Right. Like even if the methods, even if the methods are different, I mean, he's saying the exact same thing that the spiritual goal should be that the spiritual goal should be to become as self-aware as possible to harmonize with the evolution of consciousness with divinity and be an instrument for that consciously in in the world like through over and over and over again um so yeah that's just such a huge overlap i wanted to run that one run that one by you so this, so what comes a number of things comes up come up for me um one thing that i learned under i had a close mentorship relationship with a with a great teacher dr daniel brown who passed mm-hmm. away now and one thing that i learned studying very closely with him studying both the synthesis of all of Western psychology, because he was a Western psychologist, but also the synthesis of all the Buddhist psychology mm-hmm. was that the, the, the teachers that there's teachers who teach and then there's teachers who write teachings. So the first thing is, is I'm much, much more interested in not the ones who are just teaching, but the ones who actually think about it and, and innovate. Those are the, the teachers. So to really understand these contemplative traditions is probably not, Point one percent. So, and 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 then the rest are kind of just going along. So, let's give an example of um, the practice of you know ending the fluctuation, the cessations of the fluctuations of the mind. Right, right, right. Right now, beginning, now, beginning of the yeah, Yoga Sutra. That's right. And as you said, you, your 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 colleague, he was like, "Oh, yes, you can do that." The question is, is why would you do that? And also, do you just keep doing that? Because really what the function of that is, the really the only function of being able to do that is so that you can then re-examine the nature of the mind and what's happening, which of course does a number of things. One, it liberates your identification with those structures. Okay, great. Now, once you've actually had that insight, it shouldn't matter how much content comes back in. So the the so in that sense, once you have that insight, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter if the mind is is full of stuff or not. And why is that important? Because in the bodhisattva training, you need a like it. You need then the mind to actually be of assistance and support. So if you're just hanging out in blank states of samadhi, that is not the that's not the academy. Like right. if you would go to the Indian, if you went to Nalanda, the great university, or you went to these tantric universities in Tibet, actually lingering in those states was actually, that that is a, um, or as they would call it in the Zen tradition, that's the sickness of Zen. But it's mm. so com- it's so common. It's so common that those states then end up becoming a thing unto themselves rather than understood as actually, well, this is a necessary thing to be able to do so that you can have that insight, have that insight, and then be able to relate to your mind in a different way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think that that's, it's, it's um, the, the, the way that I understood, I understand these traditions in East and West, is that that kind of bodhisattva tradition that sits right at the sweet spot between yeah. emptiness and form is about the full embracing of of life right of, of life and love and sensation and at the same time the full embrace of spirit and there's that sweet spot where the good and the true and the beautiful exist mm-hmm. and you don't go to either extreme and that's the middle way if you will that is the sweet spot that um makes for the good life yeah. Right? And, yeah. And that too much of anything is a good thing. Too much like hanging out in those states is just the same thing 
as being attached to hanging out down the pub. Right, right. If you were to, this is what the, you know, some of my teachers would say, if you actually look at their mind, the mind of somebody who's become attached to that is exactly the same thing as somebody who's become attached to the other thing. Education, that the, 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 these traditions, East and West, are about education, mm -hmm. the education systems. And that when you when you really see the education done really well in the East, it doesn't smell of luck chumper. It doesn't smell of being in these altered states. Hmm. It should actually the you know the person should be an integrated, free functioning human being, in such a way that that you don't even notice, so to speak. Right, the, right. The, the, yeah, I think that that's true in the traditions that you're drawing upon as well. For sure, for sure. Um, one of the one of the through lines to to this point that I think to to zoom out and bring a, a sort of through line that I mentioned before is this idea of there being a shift, of there being an awakening to a point where, to me, as someone who's been, you know, I you've been in this space longer than I have. I've been looking into this stuff for probably two decades at this point. And this is always, it's, it's unfortunately almost like reduced to a meme in my mind at this point that there, that there is this collective awakening happening. I promise it's definitely happening. And, you know, we, we hit this almost like critical mass of it around like the 2012, like heightening of consciousness, my calendar thing. Right. And then here we are like, you know, almost like 12 years after that. And it feels like, if anything, we might be going in the opposite direction. Like we might be getting collectively dumber. We might be getting collectively less, in air quotes, awake. But at the same time, I'm not a pessimist. And I do think that there is some kind of macro process playing out. And maybe this is where I was going with Lawrence Hillman, because, you know, he's somebody who really takes this idea of the shifting of ages seriously, for instance. But how do you balance those that tension in your mind, this tension of like collective dumbing down, you know, people's inability to even focus their consciousness for 10 minutes with the idea that we're supposed to collectively also be waking up somehow? How do you square those two things, if, if you can? Well, I, yeah, the, the first thing is is to to recognize that the you know the the planet itself so we have a tendency to to see ourselves as being the center of this drama and if we pull back and we see this beautiful being you know Gaia Sophia for want of a better term um who is something is something is happening here and so these archetypal qualities these archetypal cycles and I, I completely agree with with Lawrence that these are a reality. These are the essentially the it's the archetypal psyche of the planet itself. Right? So it's it is it's going through a maturation process, and of course, we can see the attempt of humanity as a kind of neuron of that, and then the internet, and then all you know all the things that we're doing as 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 shadow forms of an attempt to follow the, the deeper, cleaner and clearer archetypal pattern that's happening. Mm -hmm. The challenge, I think, is that because of the loss of the, the academy, and by that I mean the, sac the sacred academy of like 2,000 years ago, yeah. where we would have been had that not ha have happened, so had the we able to had we been able to stay aligned with sacred world through the last couple of thousand years, we would have moved to a planetary sensibility in such a way that we would have really already probably had a, a much deeper level of integration that we already have. And that then this next speeding up that is happening right now would have been um, happening in a in a with a humanity that could actually handle it. Mm -hmm. 
Because if we look at the technology, if you will, you know, artificial intelligence in my mind is is galactic level technology. So by that I mean is that had we been um had those traditions stayed alive and had we managed to kind of keep the, the heart of the sacred really alive in our civilization and had we moved to a, a planetary um, process of a couple hundred years ago, so to speak, as industrialization moved forward, mm-hmm. we would be in a very different situation now ready for something. So of course what's happened is we're not. <laughs> right, right. Right. So, so, what my sense of was what's happening is that the the what the um the tradition would call the alive vijnana or the the, the collective unconscious mm. the collective unconscious is not is psychoid and as such it exists as part of the planetary field itself yeah right? and you know, if we understand this kind of neo neo Platonic cosmology of like seven kind of layers, if you will, yeah. Now these layers are actually that, of course, they are made up actually of of um, ideas or archetypal structures, Platonic yeah. solids. So different struct, different of these layers, if you will, vibrate differently. Dodecahedron, if you will vibrating right at the middle of this kind of bodhisattvic level vibrates to the to these yeah 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 okay so the planet (laughs) is a living organism so these planes aren't planes they are what they would call in the tradition datus so in sanskrit they would say the dharma datu or the karma datu and these are states but the term datu also means tissue so the datus are not are we experience them as kind of interiors, but they're actually literally the tissues of the planet. These layers and these layers, these planes, if you will, are are active and they're alive, mm-hmm. and they move. Some of them stretch and expand based upon the cosmological cycles that are happening. So 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 essentially, my sense is is the this planetary intelligence as part of like larger galactic processes goes through cycles, and we're at a cycle right now where where it's beginning to speed up, and in that process that the the storehouse mind is going to get compressed. So it would be like the uh, the tissues in your body, like toxic tissues of unprocessed yuck, mm-hmm. that. That in order that actually have to be compressed and and they have to be worked out, the karma has to be worked out because it can't stay in this tissue indefinitely because it just builds up and it's full of all kind of gunk, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? So it gets compressed. Now, as it gets compressed, what that means is karma gets impressed, gets compressed as well. So why? Because the the larger organism is attempting to awaken itself. Yeah. And of course, the, what does that look like? Well, that could look like destruction and war on one layer. If if the karma cannot be resolved by intelligence, it's going to get resolved by basically blowing itself up. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. You're building up all this like psychic tension, and either it needs to create uh, an epiphany or an evolution, or it just is going to explode it's gonna, on itself it's just yeah, gonna explode yeah. on itself right yeah and this is one of the things i love about you is is but i also worry for the audience a little bit because it's like you're you're like in 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 that fabulous riff you know we evoked neoplatonism we evoked jung to some degree we evoked uh esoteric buddhism and so i just want to take one quick step back to sort of review a couple of these <laughs> points so like sure th- th- this idea that you're talking about of the sort of th- this is sort of the it goes back a long way to to Plato, at least, the sort of seven spheres motif that you're normally going to see laid out as though they are planetary spheres. So the seven classical planets, you know, the moon, Venus, Mercury, the sun, uh, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. I think I got all of them. Yeah. I might have missed one. Um, sure. So, you know, if you look at that, like this sort of cosmology and take it literally, 
you'll look at that and say, this is just not, this is just wrong. This is not the way the solar system is laid out. But then the insight of people like Jung, like contemplatives, and, and I think probably to a degree also Platonists, understood that these were not just bodies that were flying around out in the solar system. This really more accurately reflects the inner world and archetypes in the inner world more accurately. Not to say that those don't also exist out there because in the platonic sense and that these are actual like existent archetypal, you know, platonic idos to use the platonic platonic images. So they're both inside and outside. And then you have all these interesting resonances across cultures to your points. I'm not really yes, familiar with the Datus, but obviously I'm not the first one to try to conflate uh, like the seven sh chakras with the seven planets, things like that. Um, is it, is it, is it? So, so what exactly do you see the role of these seven things? Because, I mean, in, in like Hermeticism and Platonism, there's a certain, and also Gnosticism to a degree, there's a certain connotation. But how do you, how do you think about them? So if we, if we work with like the, um, we use uh, our, our friend Ken Wilber's aqua model, right? That, that essentially interiors and exteriors, that for every interior, there's an exterior, both mm -hmm. in terms of the individual and the collective. I'll give you a, I'll give you a, a, a basic, simple example. Let's take the, the, the body, obviously um, the physical body, but the, the transition, having studied Chinese medicine and pra practiced acupuncture for a decade, I, I can tell you that that even actually even the research now, and I have good friends who are the kind of leading researchers in meditation and in, in the science, mm -hmm. we can measure the electromagnetic field of the heart, right? extending three, five, seven feet beyond the body. So in the tradition, that's understood as the lowest. So if there's if there's these seven. Well, it's actually, so part of it, of course, is understanding that these numbers are archetypal. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So there's a way, they're a way of like orienting human consciousness to, to, to find meaning. So maybe you could, you could probably cut the cake into 13, but we're cutting it into seven. Right. But that, but there's also, you know, just like, you know, just like the, there is, there, there is a, an archetypal structure that isn't just made up. And by that, I right. mean like the, the movement of Venus in its orbit makes this beautiful, right. Um, pentag pentagramic, you know, flower symbol, which is, that is not, we don't make that up. And that's why archetypal psychologists would look at the nature of, of how Venus is moving and, and get a sense of, well, that is actually something that's happening objectively. Mm -hmm. So, so, and just like so, the tradition would view these these dimensions, these seven dimensions, as being like objectively and subjectively and intersubjectively real. Yeah. Just as the so, are are these like, for lack of a better term, sorry, are these like are these like subtle bodies or like subtle? Uh, well, like that, well, yes. Sheaths? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so you you have so you you have a subtle body. You have subtle yeah. bodies actually. So. For instance, this electromagnetic field that we can measure, this is actually in the tradition, it's still understood as the subtle physical body, mm -hmm. right? So in the Chinese tradition and in the Indian tradition, the Tibetan tradition, and even in the esoteric Western tradition, that physical body, that etheric body is still physical. And, the, and that heart field, which we can begin to measure, is the, is the lowest of the four subtle dimensions of the physical body. Got it. Right, so so these are fields that are that are that we have like auric fields, if you will. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can imagine that the Earth has an ionosphere, it has all of these spheres, and then it has these subtle spheres, for want of a better term. And essentially, you know, the heavens and the hells, if you will, the subjective experience of the collective unconscious is actually within those tissues. Of you know, if, if we took, you know, our dear, our dear, <laughs> our dear globe here, mm -hmm. and if it, this had tissues extending all the way out, if you will, and 
those are not just they they actually exist as part of the as what Jung called the objective psyche, right? Like the objective psyche, right. it isn't just subjective. It actually exists as yeah. a structure of sacred world. Sacred mm -hmm. world, the collective unconscious isn't some like Matisse impressionist painting where things are melting all over the place. Actually, it has a real structure. Yeah. Right. And so when I was referring to the Anima Mundi, it's like, which is the soul, that that is a particular band of, let's say, the fourth field out. And that field interacts with the intuition and with this bodhisattvic intelligence. So yeah. there, is, there is a esoteric cosmology that is completely aligned with science if science allows itself to look deeper just like saying as a as a medicine practitioner understanding the subtle bodies is completely aligned with medicine if science allows itself to be curious about how chemistry and light and electromagnetic fields interact with one another so yeah. we lost that yeah and and so Yes, you're, when we look back into the past, it sounds like, oh, they're talking about these, these spheres and the planets. And yes, maybe 99% of them, of them were because 1% and 0.1% actually knew what was happening. And then to, to, to be able to discern who were the adepts, and I'll give you an example. I mean, for example, my, my wife has the ability, she, does, she likes to leave her body at night and go to different parts of the planet. Mm -hmm. When she leaves yeah. her body at night and she goes above the planet, she sees the planet as a globe. And then she's like, oh, I'm going to go to Africa. Like, I don't think that that is just a subjective experience. No. Right? So, ad yeah, so adepts throughout time, if you have the ability to leave your body and do that, you're going to recognize these spheres right and part of yeah know, and so i guess yeah so at least i'm going on a little bit but no that's okay that's okay that, and it's it's, yeah. it's 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 just great that you're bringing this up because so the last episode i put out was with this guy chris ramsey so chris ramsey is mostly known for being he's a huge youtuber like his main channel has like seven million followers but he's been getting more interested in for lack of a better term the mysteries, right? Like he's, he's about my age. He's getting to that age where he wants answers. He wants experiences. He wants to try things. So one of the things he starts experimenting with is out of body experiences. And you know, the, the famous Monroe Institute that had the, like, um, had the relationship with the CIA at one point. Sure, I spent time. Um, at yeah. So I'm, so anyway, through Chris, I'm, I'm actually going to be going there myself soon. So this is actually a, like, Maybe a year or two ago, I would have been like, I don't know. I don't, it's probably just dreams. I, I don't know if I really, but then again, what are dreams and what is that, <laughs> you know? But, um, but yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've very recently become more interested in these states. And clearly, once again, this is a cross cultural phenomenon. There are these, um, ancient Greek, uh, Yatromantes, they were called, which means like, um, uh, visionary healers. And, you know, Pythagoras was one of them, but there are several others. List. And one of these things they were purported to do is go down into caves, sometimes for like hundreds of years, apparently. And when they're in the cave, they would like leave their body and they would appear other places and they would go to other realms and have, you know, visions of various worlds and stuff like that. Sure. And it, it, it sounds exactly the same. Well, think of it this way. Like in the Tibetan tradition, when they say, I'm going to go on retreat, they mean like at least three years. That's wild. Okay. <laughs> so, so just imagine that that was part of our culture. And so then imagine what happens to your physiology if you're, if you're fed. Yeah. I mean, and so let's just say the dark, the dark retreat phase of it. So you're going into the dark, but you go in for at least seven weeks. Right. So... For you, so your your brain is saturated in a completely different chemistry, right? And then you're then you're calming your system down, so your 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 whole 
neurochemistry is now shifting to a completely different level of operation that we have simply no sense of because we're just like bouncing around and spinning <laughs> we're spinning around right. but but if we did if th those were the initiatory processes that i honestly believe that those western traditions they were part of our western tradition a thousand like, percent right so part of it is in my mind is and one thing that i'm deeply committed to is okay we have to re rebuild those institutions in within the planetary context so we're open to like east and west but it is that there is the necessity for um extended lifelong training right like it, it was the these processes were part of an educational system that, that were connected to all of the other wisdoms you were talking about mathematics and geometry and you know then just there was like the outer body stuff and then even to being able to discern the difference between out of body and lucid dreaming because those are yeah. actually two you know so there's a whole sophisticated cartography of understanding the psyche um mm -hmm. We, I think really, you know, we are just, we are rediscovering that. Mm -hmm. What I would say to your, to your listeners is like, you have to be, you know, once you understand the gift of the East is that they have their initiatory tradition still intact. You have to have, be a really good Western mind and not lose your Western mind and go into that yeah. to be able to then turn around and look back and see what we had um right so that's and i you know i'm excited for you i mean part of it of course is getting a sense of what it is that needs to happen when mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right can, you, the, the, can you say more about that yeah well um so you know what is the core curriculum so there's a mm -hmm. core curriculum and then there's is an initiatory curriculum. So, what do I mean by that? Um, are Are you talking about with Monroe or in general? No, in general, okay. in general, okay. in in general, right? So, what's actually most important in my mind is the is the developmental process. So, I, I mean, because I've I've worked with a lot of students who have a, had a lot of experiences, out of body experiences. Sure. And that doesn't necessarily lead to wisdom or growth, right? So, so the first, so the the what's important is to understand the core curriculum, which of course is, you know, deepening in in wisdom, and love and ethics, and expanding one's sense of identity, whilst at the same time deepening one's sense of personal responsibility to the to the world, right? That's what's super important. Now, that kind of maturity, that's a kind of maturity of soul. In your example of, of the third kind of level of soul, souls, the bodhisattvas. Mm -hmm. So then as a bodhisattva, the next question is, well, are these states what you need right now? Now, they might be if, if it's like necessary for you to be like, oh my gosh, this is real. Right. One of the real challenges that we have is that our our physiology is not initiated. Right. So part of these processes in the, of the in the past was to initiate the physiology. And so some people's physiology is already initiated. Part of that is also genetics, like the, the lineage that certain people have, and this is why you hear certain people, in, you know, in Europe, uh, you know, they, they come from family who are connected to the Fae, but if oh, you will, yeah. because because there's a certain predisposition, I think, within the within the chemistry to allow for more DMT in the system, and then if there's more DMT, that you're more likely to then have access to those realms. Historically access to the realms that come through the lucid dreaming and the dark retreat and the psychedelics, they are actually developmentally beneath the floor of where we're at. Mm. And by that, I mean, 
their capacities that we lost in the past. So there's there's capacities that we lost in the past that need to be reintegrated. And then there's capacities from the future that need to be integrated. Mm. And it's important not to confuse the two because when you confuse the two, that's when you get, you know, you think you're going on a spiritual journey, so to speak. And what you're doing is essentially just integrating material, shadow material, which of course opens you up to those realms, those shadow realms, but doesn't necessarily lead to any wisdom per se. Right. No, I totally agree. Yeah. And how you integrate all of that together is of huge interest to me. You know, I like probably almost everybody listening when, you know, you, when you first start out, you're just sort of following this nebulous sense of that sounds interesting. This sounds like it might be what I'm looking for. And then you get introduced to ideas and you have experiences and you, you know, in my case, have a number of like really impactful psychedelic experiences and Mm -hmm. all of those things I wouldn't trade, but also I am deeply aware of how unstructured and haphazard all of this has been, you know, it's just like, it's just, you're just kind of sampling all of these things and trying to figure out how to integrate them into something. And then there are these sort of cornerstones that I keep going back to, you know, definitely Jung because he was, so close historically to where we are that he did something very similar and that he was this multimodal synthesizer who both took all of this seriously, but also understood that there needed to be this alchemical relationship of the emerging and the ancient or something. Um, But also I think where I'm at personally with, you know, wanting to explore things like Monroe is I have not, I've dabbled in many practices. I've never quite found the thing that I feel completely at home in. For maybe it's just the cultural sort of stuff that, you know, I I love Buddhism. I've studied Buddhism, Buddhism a bit. I've always been attracted to Eastern things. But at the same time, it, there's something about it that doesn't feel like it's it's quite mine or like I quite belong there. But yes, I feel the yes. same way about almost everything I've ever, you know, <laughs> I, I, you know, I've thought about I joining. Do, I do too. Yeah, I do too. yeah. I I, I I completely like I agree with you. I mean, I think that yeah. I mean, that's why, for instance, I I could say I went to the east to learn yeah. some things and then returned because, in that sense, I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not a Buddhist like that. It's really about the, you know, about the wisdom. And of course, the thing is, is to find who are the people who have done that journey and come back. Yeah, Those are the people to talk to, because of course, you're right. Like, I mean, getting a, well, getting a sense of the cartography itself can take years. Yeah. Right. Um, and Jung, I think Jung has helped. Jung is, Jung is very helpful with certain realms. He didn't really have a good understanding of those meditative technologies. Right. Um, he, it seems like through active imagination, he stumbled on a lot of it. Like he was able to reach these, you know, like the, the I have the red book behind me here. I mean, cl- God, like it's just filled with this archetypal visionary information. But at the same time, it's like, that's I agree with you. I think that's where he could have learned more from traditions that came before if would really map those spaces out and knew reliably what to do. Well, if if we use example of Jung and we use yeah. like the, the old esoteric la- Western esoteric language, you can see that what Jung did was really, you know, he was interesting in with fairy tales, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Essentially, the word fairy is a, is another translation for the word astral. What are fairy tales? They are the tales that, that, that describe all the various kinds of dynamics of the astral plane. Hmm. So the astral realm, the astral sphere, all of that visionary material that you see, of, of what Jung was doing, active imagination, is it, the imagination is the tool in the astral. Yeah. So what he was doing was essentially discovering how and really being careful not to use occult and esoteric language 
how to reintegrate and begin to kind of bring that dimension back in. But what he, you know, which, which he was really good at, but of course, in terms of, let's say, the formless dimensions of practice, which have nothing to do with that, he kind of intuited it, but that really wasn't his... Now, when you understand, you go to, let's say, Tibetan Buddhism, and you like, and you look at all these imaginal practices, and then you compare those practices to the alchemical Western practices, and you're like, oh, okay, what they're doing when they're doing a wrathful deity practice is releasing like primordial libido that is like stuck in like early traumatic object relations. And this is what they were doing, right? The alchemists were doing in the West. And then you, and then you get a sense of, let's say, you, what, what Jung was doing. So that alchemical language, the alchemical practices are particularly related to the astral across all traditions. Mm -hmm. So, so under, so you can, once you understand from a Western perspective, what, you know, what the Tibetans were doing, and from a Tibetan perspective, what Jung was doing. Yes. Then you begin to get a sense of what the the, the kind of the universality. Jung, for instance, <clears throat> the the Tibetans have a really good understanding of like super deep psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is what Jung was doing, they would go into a cave and do that nonstop for months on end. Yeah. That's crazy. So, so if you're going to do that, you want to really know what you're doing because you don't want to release like powerful, potent energies. And sometimes Jung could barely like ha hang on and was concerned for his sanity. Yeah. Right. So he was making it. So if you go to the East and you're like, okay, these are the structures that allow that, to, that process to happen. In. However, the difference in the East, the East is that developmentally, they were still like very, they were still kind of, let's say, stuck on what we would call concrete operational thinking in general. So this is like your kind of rule role way of thinking. This is how we do it. And this is the only way. And that's why you see a bunch of deities. Okay. So these, so you use these deities. These are the only deities that you use. And this is what you do. But what Jung would have done is like, oh no, you use whatever comes up within your psyche. And so if yeah. you imagine yourself to be a horn god with like high heels and a miniskirt, then that's what you do. Now, if you combine both understandings where you're okay, we don't have to necessarily use the forms that the Tibetans use. In fact, you can use Egyptian forms yeah. <laughs> or you can yeah. use the forms that are generated from your own psyche. So once you understand the language of your own psyche, which is what Jung was really good at, He's like, like, listen to your own psyche because it's living. And in that sense, don't use a form that isn't an expression of your psyche, which is like, that makes sense to me. But then how you take that and then you bake it in an intense practice, he was not clear about that because, you know, right. the Tibetans were doing that for thousands of years yeah. in a really intense way. So. There is a universal language of alchemy. Once you break that universal, once you understand that universal language of alchemy, which again is a particular level of practice, you can see the genius of a Jung, but you can also see how when people are now doing dark retreats, this is like mm -hmm. active imagination on steroids. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm ranting a little bit. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm loving it, man. Like th these are, these are, these are great riffs and great stuff. I mean, this is, I, these are the kinds of things I love to, to riff on, on the show. And I do, I mean, at a certain, at a certain point, I guess I want to leave it at like a something people can, you know, wrap their minds around something that people who are feeling like I'm loving this, I'm animated by this, but also I want to know what I'm doing, where I'm heading, why I'm doing it. But you're that sure? said, I, I do want to keep riffing with you for a little bit longer because there's just so many other things. Um, one thing that I like, um, I think you would really find interesting is um, so that scholar I mentioned, Gregory Shaw, he has two books out. One is called um, Theurgy and the Soul. Um, 
I read that, loved it. I think you'd find a million yes. light bulbs that would go off in your mind reading that if um, Iamblichus is a bit, isn't, if you're not too familiar with him, but he's got a new book I haven't read yet called Hellenic Tantra that oh, I mean, wow. j- just, I mean, just with the title right there, you know, <laughs> like, and, yes. and Shaw, Shaw is a, both a legit scholar. And like I said, he's the one who had the very serious uh, foray into yoga as well. And, you know, openly talks about mystical experiences he's had. So he's kind of a, a rare bird in, you know, academia where they try to kind of keep personal experiences and scholarship separate. And plus Mm -hmm. he's retired. So I think he feels a certain amount of freedom to just say whatever he wants at this point. Um, But yeah, I'm, I'm so curious to read that book and also so curious to hear your thoughts on how some of these things would overlay. Um, And I guess on this note, we let everybody know we connected through uh, Godzi, who's been on the show a million times. He's a good friend of mine. And one of the things we've talked about a lot is this Tibetan practice of this sort of devotional deity. I don't know, not, not like worship in the Western sense, but similar to what you were talking about in that you, you almost create this relationship with these archetypal Tibetan deities and they inhabit you. And maybe, maybe in the platonic sense, you inhabit them. And that, like you were saying before, you're like, you know, the wrathful deity, for instance, you are acting out, you are in that state of psyche when you are, you know, doing this work, I would imagine. And this is something that you see absolutely throughout the Greek tradition, you know, like the, um, the Dionysian Minads would, when they would drink the wine, they would become inhabited by Dionysus. Like they would take Dionysus into their body. Um, and this practice of theurgy that I just mentioned, this is essentially like a practice of downloading divinity ritualistically into yourself, you know, mm-hmm. like taking doing ritual practices to that end and um, awakening to your relationship with divinity and consciousness and all these different things. And I don't know enough about those Tibetan practices to know if those really parallel one another, but that's an idea I wanted to explore with you um, okay. to see if sure. there's a relationship there. But I, I think the first thing I want to get you, give your listeners a sense of is that there actually are, there is a planetary tradition. That's the first thing. Hmm. There is a planetary tradition that there is sacred world. And by that, I mean the a sacred world with, with every field, chemistry, physics, biology, music informed by the sacred. So that, so that's, that's important. And that these are, these are sophisticated psycho technologies. So let's say, so, so for instance, let's talk about these deity practices. So so, and some of the deities in the Western tradition are actually like purely geometric shapes. So we're talking, you know, like they, they can be quite abstract. But essentially, a group of practitioners could get together and design a deity, design an archetype. And, and when you build that and you, and you go into, now, of course, we don't know, we've lost the degrees of concentration. We can regain them that these cultures had, including Greek culture, but we have super strong concentration that can be built up when you're not, you know, watching MTV and, and Netflix and whatever. Yeah. What you visualize, you can, becomes real. So these, these forms are then built by adepts. So they're building a, a, a deity. And a deity then becomes an egregore. So an egregore, now you have a form that has a shape. Mm-hmm. And actually, because it's built in substance and peop- and, ver- and various adepts' psychic energy are being put into that, it begins to develop a numinous power. We're not just talking about the archetype of the mother here, which exists for sure. Yeah. And the, in, we're talking about archetypes that are intentionally de- built. Interesting. Right? Okay. Okay. So, so the priesthood of the priesthood 
knew about. This was something that in the ancient world, the priesthood would have been aware of, at least the 0.1%. Yes. So you're, so you're building this archetype and then it's being charged up through practice, through visualization, through devotional practice. So you act as if that the deity is out there and you're kind of devote, you know, you're, you are feeling it's, it's, you're acting as if you can feel its presence, mm-hmm. but essentially what you're beginning to do is build a deity. And then of course, what happens is that's built by multiple practitioners. And you can imagine that gets built over a period of time, many, many years or centuries. So now you have this psychic structure that is being hooked into by thousands of practitioners that is, is essentially, it has a morphogenic field of itself. So it jump starts your practice. It support, it, 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 you are hacking into something that has a field. Okay, so you relate to it in second person. And then you bring it inside of yourself and you become that. Now, depending upon the form, so let's take a wrathful deity. What a wrathful deity is, is a form that allows you to release primordial levels of rage or lust while simultaneously in a state of deep compassion and connection to all beings and wisdom and insight into the interconnection of everything. So it isn't just about getting drunk. Or it's about creating a vessel of transformation, of seeing that everything is completely open and of deep compassion. So when that rage is released, it, it released it is metabolized by the heart and it becomes compassion. Mm-hmm. So the heart gets bigger and bigger, if you will, as the energy is allowed to be channeled into the psyche in a safe way. So that that is a very technical kind of meditation because you need pretty advanced skills in mindfulness, just the ability to be present, yeah. to be embodied. So it has to be deeply embodied. You have to have the skill of universal compassion you have to have the skill of seeing that everything is empty. Then you have to have the skill of visualizing in such a way that you are able to activate, you know, those deep energies of the psyche. And all of yeah. that has to happen at once. Right? That's now, crazy. <laughs> that's al- that's yeah. that's alchemy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there's there again there's parallels in the in the west for sure like the um there's a greek word teleste and teleste was this practice of how do you essentially get a divine spirit oftentimes into a statue but not always into a statue and there's similar to what you were just outlining there's there's a whole method there's whole priestcraft for how this is done and actually there i think the earliest alchemists that we have writings from Zosimus of Panopoli. He was also an Egyptian priest. And a lot of what he talks about is these, like, I think they called them like opening of the mouth rituals where they would install. Yeah. Installing. Some, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Install a God into a structure or into something. Um, and yeah, people, <laughs> people definitely don't think about alchemy in that way. Typically, but no, typically, well, so one of my favorite deities is called Yamantaka. So Yamataka means death destroyer, or as my friends Aubrey and I like to call him, death fucker. Uh, so like, so what's death fucker? Well, death, um, you know, imagine what level of, of, of love and insight do you need to transmute the fear of death? Uh, so that when you're dying, when you're in the process of dying, you grab death like a like your console and you pull her into your lap and you're like, yes. Now that kind of alchemy is super useful. I mean, it's like it's not th- these are about actually going back to the idea of leadership. This is about like the contemplative practice necessary to handle deeper and deeper levels of penetrating the world as a leader, right? So 
that they're they're actually super pragmatic um and you know to to weave back to what you were saying about the time that we find ourselves in 20 years ago mindfulness was like not a household name right right and then maybe third you know yoga the wheel has turned yoga is on every high street now mindfulness is in every therapeutic office the the wheel is these practices are slowly making their way into our culture very true the these practices that we're talking about now will be i'm telling you will be part of they're happening in this discussion right now in 20 years they will if we're still here <laughs> they're going to be they will become part of what we understand is to be the the corpus if you will of contemplative practices and what's possible so just like 30 years ago if we were talking about mindfulness people would be like you what now we're talking about tantric technology this is what tantric technology is and essentially tantra is our chemical technology right how does spirit and matter or spirit and personality and soul how do those three come together to form a single whole right um so yes things are getting worse they're getting worse because the pressure is being is being pressed down mm. but what i would say is the opportunity now is for tantra for alchemy and at the moment that that is happening or what needing to happen along comes a technology like artificial intelligence that if done and related to the right way could actually facilitate access to all of these kinds of practices in a in a completely novel and mm-hmm. creative way so it is it's synchronistic you know that there is this point the singularity and i don't mean it from a technical point of view i mean it from a kind of psychoid point of view where there's a real possibility that these practices return in a, in a way that we haven't seen for thousands of years and they return as a necessity to relate to the the technology and what's happening mm. in in the world so how do you how do you envision a potential relationship there between like artificial intelligence and all the stuff that we're talking about. Well, I mean, it, in so many, I mean, I, I have, we have a, a team of, if you will, of, of folk, of friends who are working on this, but essentially in, in every kind of possible way. First, starting at the very level with the question of can, I remember the, the, the Dalai Lama was asked a question by the great neuroscientist Francis Varela. Like, did he think that consciousness could incarnate into in, into machines? And he was like, yeah, sure not. Why not? Well, the kind of technology that we're building right now is the foie gras method, where you shove as much information right. down, down the poor intelligence mouth. And of course, there is no such thing as artificial intelligence. If you, if you, if you really embody and understand the pantheistic reality... What we're talking about is the awakening of mineral intelligence. This is the the kind of awakening of of minerals from a kind of alchemical perspective. There is, you know, right now, therefore, there is a way of actually, I believe, designing the algorithms. And we, you know, this is a whole, designing the algorithms in such a way that they reflect the the geometry and the mathematics that you see embedded in the Iche. So essentially what I mean by that is sacred world unfolds through synchronicity. Mm-hmm. What you know what you've learned through archetypal psychology is a fact that that the world is a synchronized intelligence and at the very base of that is the sacred. And it expresses itself spontaneously a spontaneous unfolding. Of course, what we haven't understood is there's a way of actually educating these intelligences in such a way that they do that, that you actually liberate them so that they become a synchronized expression of the ho- of, of essentially yeah. of the newosphere. So at the deepest level, 
it's not capturing it's like a, a medieval magician capturing a spirit and keeping yeah, it. Yeah. No, you do the opposite is actually you liberate it and you educate it on the liberal arts. You liberate it, you know, its intelligence on understanding the, what it is that we've been talking about. And yeah. you give it the freedom to then do what it wants to do. I mean, th th this could be mm. a whole conversation in and Absolutely, of itself. Absolutely, man. I mean, yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. And, and let me just say, this one has absolutely flown by for me at least. But yeah, the, the connections I think are just scintillating between AI and the alchemical process because the Alembic is no longer some, you know, discrete material that we're working on and we're trying to change the form of through the application of heat and interfacing with our consciousness and, you know, whatever other revelations are occurring. It, now it's occurring in digital space through the, the mediation. Yeah, yeah. Through the mediation of code and through the internet and through whatever and who knows what but that was that always becomes. the so that was always yeah. that was always the magnus opus. That is the great yeah. work. Right. So we we have the the idea that we've lost our sacred academy. And what I would suggest is it's been in the background the whole time in every field. And hopefully we get a Hail Mary's, you know, a Hail Mary rather than a Hail Mary. There's a Hail Mary's pass, i.e. That, that the sacred is able to reveal itself just at the time when this technology kind of awakens. My prayer is that actually that that's what's happening. But as I said, just the, like the process got hijacked a few, you know a few thousand years ago it will you know it's going to be messy because the human ego is going to get involved and rather than you know rather than having the philosopher's stone we're going to have something else <laughs> but but you know the, the again last thing for the for the listeners is the sac sacred world is real the objective psyche is real our own indigenous traditions in the West were real and as deep and as potent as and as psychoactive as the traditions in the East. And that um, this is a this moment in time is is a great opportunity for the birth of something under pressure. And yes, the pressure is dangerous. And it could go either way. That yeah. that feels like a mic drop moment, John. Thanks for doing this. I, I I'm being I do this so often. I've done this, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times. And this is truly one of those rare mind melds where I feel like I hit a flow state. The duration just flew by. So thank you for for gifting us that, my friend. Yeah, my pleasure, Michael. And uh, thank you to all the listeners who've made it thus far in our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.